I want you to hit me as hard as you can. One happy 1999! Looking back, the year 1999 had a massive impact on cinema and is widely considered one of the best years in film history, with movies like Fight Club, The Sixth Sense, Magnolia, The Blair Witch Project, Galaxy Quest, Toy Story 2, and The Matrix, all becoming immediate or eventual classics of their respective genres. And then there was Wild Wild West. This expensive big screen adaptation of a 1960s Western spy show would feature an actor at the apex of his fame, along with some Oscar-level supporting talent, a respected director, and of course, a giant mechanical spider. How did these impressive ingredients result in a spectacular disaster? Roll into the wild, wild west. And find out what the f happened to this movie. In 1992, plans were set in motion to adapt the stylish Robert Conrad Ross Martin TV series Wild Wild West. At the time, movie adaptations of popular shows were not exactly a fresh concept. Just one year earlier, director Barry Sonnenfeld had helped demonstrate there was an audience for such things with the highly successful screen update of The Addams Family. So it wasn't surprising when Warner Brothers tried to mimic that success by hiring Lethal Weapon screenwriter Shane Black to write a script for their recently optioned Western property. The studio then wanted to bring on his fellow Lethal Weapon talent Richard Donner and Mel Gibson. That plan collapsed when the star and director instead decided to make a different adaptation of an old Western TV show, Maverick. The studio then approached Tom Cruise to take on the role of Secret Service agent Jim West. But once again, a different TV series adaptation would lure Cruise away from the project. After those back-to-back -back talent departures, Wild Wild West was put on the back burner for two years until Warner Brothers brought in writers S.S. Wilson and Brent Maddock, who were responsible for Short Circuit and Tremors. The duo would perform a page one rewrite of a previous draft by Predator screenwriters Jim and John Thomas. Around that same time, Will Smith was approached to star in the film. Oddly enough, Smith turned down the lead role of Neo in The Matrix because he wanted to get away from the sci-fi genre but apparently thought a western action comedy was a big enough deviation from his previous efforts. Thanks for watching Joe Blow videos. If you enjoy our shows, please like and subscribe and click the bell to be notified when new videos go live. Now, back to the show. After Smith accepted the lead role, his Men in Black director Barry Sonnenfeld was suggested and he jumped at the opportunity having grown up watching the original TV show. From there, Sonnenfeld wanted his friend George Clooney to star opposite Will Smith as Artemis Gordon, and the actor agreed, pending a new draft of the script. But after Clooney saw the rewrite, he declined, because Smith had all the funny dialogue and he was not interested in playing the straight man. But the problems were just beginning. The film had a notoriously eccentric producer in John Peters, who started in the business as Barbara Streisand's hairdresser and romantic partner and transitioned to producing with her 1976 film A Star Is Born. By the 1990s, after successes like Caddyshack, Flashdance, Rain Man, and Tim Burton's Batman, John Peters was the walking stereotype of Hollywood producers, a wealthy egomaniac prone to screaming, physical violence, and bizarre creative contributions. One famous story of Peters' outlandish input came from Kevin Smith, who met with the producer to discuss the script for Superman Lives. Peters gave Smith three non-negotiable mandates. Superman could not fly, would not wear the iconic costume, and, most prominently, had to fight a giant spider in the third act. Smith was also required to read his finished draft aloud to Peters. You want me to, like, tuck him in after I'm done? The producer's brilliant ideas didn't stop there. Screenwriter Brent Maddock said that they discussed a scene where Jim West rides on horseback through the night to meet with the president. Peters instead proclaimed that horses were boring and the movie should have motorcycles. Maddock explained that those vehicles did not exist in the movie's 1868 setting, but Peters persisted. Fortunately, his idea didn't make the final cut, or at least not exactly like we might expect. Curiously, Maddock and Wilson's draft had included the mechanical spider, which Peters surprisingly rejected, instead suggesting yet another anachronism, 
a huge flying stealth bomber. It was actually Barry Sonnenfeld who ultimately approved the massive motorized arachnid, although he later admitted it was one of the factors that ruined the film. Either way, Peters finally got his giant spider. Academy Award winner Kevin Klein came on board to play gadget-inventing secret agent Artemis Gordon, and also U.S. President Grant for some reason. Salma Hayek would be the sexy potential love interest, and Oscar-nominated actor Kenneth Branagh would play the movie's villain Dr. Loveless, a dastardly engineering genius in a motorized wheelchair. When the cast assembled for a table read, Branagh showed up with his beard shaved like his character and only spoke in his southern accent the entire day. His performance was so convincing that a studio executive didn't even realize it was Branagh, and he thought Sonnenfeld should hire the guy in the room instead. After yet another rewrite from a different set of screenwriters, filming on Wild Wild West commenced in April of 1998, with the goal of having it in theaters for July 4th the following year a weekend that had proven to be enormously profitable for Will Smith's movies. Sonnenfeld had perceived the Artemis Gordon character as the straight man to Will Smith, something that had worked so well on Men in Black with Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. But while filming, Kevin Klein, who had won an Oscar for a comedy, had a hard time relinquishing all the laughs to Smith, so their scenes became a game of one-upmanship to see who could be more funny. That skewed dynamic is so pronounced in the final film that it's practically impossible to tell who's supposed to be the serious straight shooter and who's the wacky sidekick. Actress Sophia Eng, who plays a lip-reading henchwoman named, uh, Miss Lippenreader, later said that Kevin Klein was agitated that he did not receive the same attention and respect on the set as Smith and Branagh. Sonnenfeld even fueled the rivalry between Klein and Branagh by pretending to confuse their previous acting roles, hoping it would translate to their antagonistic relationship on the screen, whatever that was worth. After production wrapped, the film began having test screenings, which were a catastrophe. Test audiences couldn't tell if it was meant to be a comedy or an action film. They found that Smith wasn't funny enough, and it felt more like a bland PG movie rather than an edgy PG-13. The studio then sunk an additional $40 million into rewrites and reshoots, adding more innuendo and adult humor. Sonnenfeld disliked the tiresome double entendres and clunky rewrites, which he thought ultimately resulted in a jumbled mess with no consistent tone, and turned the Loveless character from pure evil into more of a joke. Upon seeing the re-edited film with Warner executives, he honestly thought it could not be salvaged. One scene that, to Sonnenfeld, best encapsulated the entire mess is when Jim West suddenly appears in disguise as a belly dancer to distract Loveless. The director found the sequence baffling and unnecessary, and it exists because John Peters loved it and refused to let them remove it. This seems to be a running theme with Peters, who got Klein in drag earlier in the movie and had also insisted on Kurt Russell wearing a dress in Tango and Cash. Sonnenfeld suspects the ridiculous scene is the last straw for audiences and cringes at how little sense it makes in the context of the film. But at the time, he just didn't have enough Hollywood clout to go against the powerful producer. After an extravagant world premiere party, Wild Wild West opened on June 30th, 1999. The film had an uphill battle from the start, with a cost that had ballooned to a rumored $180 million which at the time was one of the most expensive ever made. The movie earned just $27 million for its first three-day weekend. Unlike Will Smith's previous dominance over the July 4th holiday, Wild Wild West was shaping up to be a box office bomb. Audience word of mouth was terrible, and response from critics was even worse, calling it exhausting and smutty, with comedy that completely missed the mark. Roger Ebert said that Smith and Klein lacked any semblance of chemistry, and that the special effects in the film were like watching a bag of money burn on the screen. The movie did finally manage to take in $222 million at the worldwide box office, although it has been speculated that, at least in the U.S., many teenagers were buying tickets and then sneaking in to see the R-rated South Park bigger, longer, and uncut. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the movie was popular at the Razzie Awards that year, winning five out of eight nominated categories. Robert Conrad, the star of the original series, actually appeared at the ceremony to accept the awards and express his disappointment with the finished product. If the film had a bright spot, it was the funky hit title track by Will Smith, 
which now seems like a relic from a time when summer blockbusters all had tie-in songs by major artists. Since the movie's release, everyone involved, except John Peters of course, have publicly acknowledged its questionable quality. Kevin Klein has stated that he's a better actor than the movie indicates. Salma Hayek, rightfully, felt underused and seems to be present only for the men to comment on her curves. He said it's nice having her on board, she's a breast of fresh air. Kenneth Branagh has proclaimed that his southern drawl is perhaps the worst American accent by a British actor in film history. Nice of you to join us tonight and add color to these monochromatic proceedings. And the movie has become a punchline for Will Smith, who has admitted he did the film for all the wrong reasons, because he had set his sights on becoming the world's biggest star, ignoring good storytelling in the process. I just made that up. The movie's original writers, Wilson and Maddock, who were invited to the premiere only to find that nothing on the screen resembled their original script, actually tried, unsuccessfully, to have their names removed from the film. While they admit it was the highest paying job of their careers, they also feel the credit on such a monumental flop obstructed future Hollywood opportunities. Wild Wild West would go on to be considered one of the worst films of the 20th century, among company like Battlefield Earth and Batman and Robin. Still, that notoriety must count for something. Many better movies are forgotten about within months, but Wild Wild West has remained a talking point for over 20 years. Sure, we all revisit classics like Fight Club and The Matrix to see the greatness from the year 1999, but an exorbitantly expensive genre mashup with talented actors and a lumbering steam-powered spider can't really be that bad. Can it? When you're telling this story to your grandkids, you make sure that you leave this part out. Let us know your thoughts. Leave a comment in the comments. And thanks for watching.